Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see you all back again. We'll start program number three for this afternoon. And again, we just like to invite our television audience to join with us. And uh, like everybody here, open your book and uh, get a pen and a notepad and take notes. Because uh, what you write, you're more apt to remember than what you just sit and say, yep, I'll remember that. No, you won't. It's, uh, that's why I keep reviewing. It takes a long time. You know, we were just rehearsing again at break time. How many times we have to hear these things before they really settle in. And uh, that's why I don't apologize too much for repeating. Now, I realize that all this has been covered before, but, you know, a lot of it has been several years ago, so it's about time we do hit it again. <clears throat> so, again, for those of you on television, again, we just covet your prayers my how we need your prayers because uh, the devil doesn't like what we're doing now that's all there's to it and uh, and we can witness that from time to time all right let's go right back where we left off and uh, we're still in Acts chapter 2 and remember now Christ has just ascended 10 days earlier and uh, now the day of Pentecost has arrived the Jewish feast day according to Leviticus chapter 23 and it's all Jewish there's nothing of Gentile in here whatsoever <clears throat> so now let's just come down to verse 22 Peter has just finished quoting Joel chapter 2 of the horrors of the tribulation according to prophecy and he gives it as though that's what Israel is looking for. He has no idea that it's going to be interrupted for 2,000 years. All right, so after rehearsing the prophecy from Joel, down verse 22, and again, I want to always emphasize, it's all Jewish. Ye men of Israel. There's no Gentile in that. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. And then he speaks of how <clears throat> Christ had been delivered up to the Romans for his crucifixion. And then verse 24, whom God raised up. Now you see, what is Peter already driving home to the nation of Israel? That that promised Messiah who lived and performed signs and wonders and miracles was rejected, was put to death, and was buried, but was raised from the dead has gone back to glory, waiting for the day when he can come back. See? So what does Peter have to prove? Your Messiah is still alive. He is still going to fulfill those promises. Now, that reminds me of a verse that I used again just the other night. And uh, come back and look at it with me so that you'll get the gist of this promised Messiah for Israel. Romans 15, verse 8. <clears throat> From the pen of the Apostle Paul, after the fact, and Paul is writing to us, Gentiles. And so it's for us to know how these things transpire. That's why I'm connecting the dots. It all fits, see? Like putting the puzzle together. Everything in its rightful place and it'll fit. All right? Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the what? Circumcision. Not the whole world. He was the minister of Israel. And Israel alone. All right, so he was the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. And I always say, wasn't something Paul dreamed up. It was all part of God's sovereign plan for the ages. All right, so he came as the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. Now, what was the purpose? To confirm or bring to fulfillment the promises made to the world? No. To the fathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the rest of the Old Testament patriarchs. 
were way back then already looking for this coming glorious kingdom on earth. Now that reminds me. I haven't used this in ages. I hope I can find it. Job. Come all the way back to Job. Where is it? It's in front of Psalms. I thought it was behind it. Job. My goodness, I hope I can find it. I think it's chapter 16. Or 14. Job, it's in front of Psalms. Oh, my goodness. I might have, as I've said before, I walk into a buzzsaw when I try to find a verse and can't. But uh, just a second. If I can't find it, I'll just have to quote it from memory. But this is Job speaking. Okay, it is. 19. I was close. Job 19. Verse 25. Now this is one of the oldest books in the Old Testament, beloved. And look what Job was already looking for. See? Job 19, verse 25. Now this ought to give you goosebumps. I get them every once in a while. My, when they call and tell me what is happening by using our DVDs, I either ball or I get goosebumps. That's pretty typical. But here it is, see? Verse 25. For I know. I hope these guys get it on the, on the screen. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Isn't there yet? I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand... Where? On the earth. See? I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day, at the time of the end, upon the earth. Now, you can't get it any player it is. I want my audience to read it. Thanks, fellas. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, death, see? And he'll go back to the dust. Yet in my flesh, what kind of flesh? Resurrected, I shall see God. Now, isn't that plain? Now, that was the hope of an Old Testament writer way, way back. But he had an insight that after this life of flesh, there is an eternal resurrected life on the earth. That's the part I want you to see. Not up in the ethereal heaven someplace, on the earth. And that's the earthly kingdom that every Old Testament believer was constantly looking for and waiting for. And here we've had 2,000 years of theology, and they still haven't got it. Isn't it unusual? <laughs> they still can't get it. Well, anyway, some of them do. Don't worry, there are some. In fact, somebody sent me an interesting article off the Internet the other day, and I'm going to put it in my next newsletter. It was written in 1935, and as the gal said who sent it, Les, you could have written this. And she said, it just proves you're not some weirdo <laughs> coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> but you see, most of Christendom just won't see it. But that's nothing new. I'm not the first nor the last. All right, back to the Acts chapter 2. So here we have now Peter addressing the nation of Israel with the primary message again that this Jesus of Nazareth that they had presented to Israel for three years with signs and wonders, and was alive. He hasn't lost his ability to be the king, see? All right, so he's alive. He has been raised from the dead. And then he goes through some of the Psalms. Now, like I say, this isn't a verse-by-verse -verse study. This is just connecting the dots. All right, so now he goes back into the Psalms, and he quotes David. Verse 27. Quotes out of the Psalms. 
because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or the place of the dead, neither wilt thou permit thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now Peter says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is dead and buried, just like Job, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. But, verse 30, why does Peter quote David? He was a prophet. See? Therefore, being a prophet, we normally don't think of David as a prophet, do we? We think him as the writer of the songs and the psalms and so forth. No, he was also a prophet foretelling future events, see? All right, so therefore being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, the lineage of David, what would happen? God would raise up Christ Jesus of Nazareth to do what? To sit on David's throne, see? All looking forward to this glorious kingdom. Not a word in here about the body of Christ. Not a word about the church. It's all tied to Israel's prophetic promises. Okay, now then, verse 31. He's seeing this, David, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul, his spirit, was not left in hell, or we know he went down into the paradise side, neither did his flesh see corruption. See? Because he was divine. He was not that much of the human. See, that's why God the Father was the, the progenitor of the body of Jesus, and his blood was divine, and it was holy, and not fit for corruption. All right, now then, verse 32, Peter again hammers the fact home that this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted because of that finished work of the cross, see? And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this, this coming of the Holy Spirit on this day of Pentecost, which you now see and hear. He says, David is not the one who ascended into the heavens, but he said himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy phones thy footstool. That's Psalms 110 verse 1. In other words, David is prophetically speaking of the ascension of Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father, and on some future day, he would leave that seated position and return to Jerusalem. See? All right, now then, verse 36. And oh, if only these people who demand water baptism, according to verse 38, could just read 36, but they can't. They can't read it for some reason or other. Evidently, it's blanked out in their Bible or something. But here it is. Therefore, let all the house of Israel. Any Gentiles in that? Not that I can see. Therefore, because of what Peter has just brought out of the prophets, Joel, David, and the Psalms, now, because of all those prophetic promises given to the nation of Israel for over a period of 2,000 years, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus of Nazareth, of Bethlehem, whom you have crucified, put to death, but he's still Lord and Christ. Death didn't stop anything, see? Now verse 37. Now when they, now don't forget, who is Peter preaching to? Jews. 
from all over the then known world. Therefore, or I'm sorry, verse 37. Now then, when they heard this, what he had just been rehearsing, they were convicted in their heart, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, all 12, now remember, are involved in all of this, men and brethren, what shall we do? See? Not what shall we take by faith, what shall we do? Now remember, I could take you back, I haven't got time, I don't think. I could take you back to Exodus, and when God laid all this out in front of the nation of Israel, how did Israel respond? Tell us what you want us to do, and we will what? Believe it? No. We'll do it. What a difference. Today, Paul doesn't say do this or do that. He just says believe it. All right, here's Israel, though. This isn't Gentile ground. This is God dealing with his covenant people. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here was the answer. Clear as language complaints can make it, but it's not for us. This is for Israel. Never does Paul use this kind of language. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, forgiveness, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's all the promises made to the nation of Israel. All right, now I've been stressing all the time that it's according to the covenant promises. Now let's just skip over quickly to chapter 3. Pentecost has come and gone. Time is going on. This isn't all going to happen in a week. Time has gone by. Now verse 1. But nothing has changed. Look where Peter and John go for the time of prayer. Now Peter and John went up together into the what? The temple. See? Does Paul ever tell us to go to a temple to pray? Does Paul ever tell us, find a prayer chapel and pray? No. How does, Paul in, uh, how, yeah, how does Paul instruct us? I think it's in the book of Timothy. How do we approach God in prayer? Any place. Any time. Under any circumstance. The throne room is always open. You don't need to go to a prayer room. You don't need to go to a chapel. You don't have to go to some sanctuary. Your prayer room is wherever you happen to be. What a difference. But see, back here, that wasn't the case. They were still, according to Judaism, to go up to the temple or the synagogue, in other cases, according to the hour of prayer that was designated by their religion, see? All right, then, of course, they come across the lame man, and you know the story of that. Peter says, silver and gold, I have none, but that which I have, I give unto you. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. I think he says of Nazareth. Yeah. Rise up in the name of Christ of Nazareth and walk. And then the Jews got all shook up again. How in the world did you do this? They knew the guy had been lame for 40 years. How did you do this? See? So now then, you come down to verse 12. And when Peter saw it, the consternation of the Jewish people over the healing of this lame man, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel and all you nations of the world. That's what people like to think. Not what it says. That's not what it says. Peter addresses fellow Jews. Ye men of Israel, why marvel at this? Or why look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? Verse 13. The God of Abraham. See? Takes him all the way back to the beginning of the Jewish race. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The God of our fathers hath glorified his son, Jesus, 
Now here he puts the dagger into the nation again, whom you delivered up and whom you denied in the presence of Pilate when he would turn him to let him go. See, Peter isn't going to let Israel forget their rejection of that Messiah. But he wants them to be convicted of it, repent of it, and God would still embrace the nation. He wasn't ready to cast them aside. And that's all Peter is trying to do, is get them to the place of repentance where they would yet believe who Jesus of Nazareth really was. And isn't it amazing that they never were convinced? Now, I know that may upset some Jewish listeners, and I've got a lot of them. I know I do. But you see, that's the record. That was the nation's unbelief, but that didn't mean that God wasn't ready and willing to forgive at the drop of a hat if they would just repent of what they had done nationally to their Messiah. All right, but Peter goes on to say then, see, that uh, they denied the Holy One. And they killed the prince of life. But God raised him from the dead. See, they didn't stop the God of glory. He's still going to accomplish his purposes. Now then, verse 16. And his name. See, now that's what I've been stressing for the last several programs. That Israel's kingdom gospel was based on who Jesus was. See? That's all God wanted to recognize, that he was the promised Messiah. All right, so here comes Peter now, several weeks, maybe months after Pentecost, that it was through faith in his name. Now, I've said it more than once on the program. What does that really mean? That the name of Jesus of Nazareth was synonymous with God the Son and the Messiah of Israel. He was all the same person. Believe it. See? But oh, they couldn't. I think I said it here a few programs back. What was their stock answer? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yes, the Messiah did. But they couldn't buy it. See? Well, anyway. Verse 16 again, so it was his name, the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Through faith in his name hath made this man Not a word about the work of the cross. Peter doesn't say, if you believe that Jesus died for you and shed his blood and rose from the dead, you'll be healed. No, all this man believed was that Jesus was the Christ. And as a consequence, he experienced miraculous healing. All right, now verse 17. And now, brethren, Peter says, I know that through ignorance you did it. In other words, crucified the Christ. They didn't do it knowing who he was. They didn't. In fact, I think I've got time. Come ahead with me again to a statement from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2, 1 <clears throat> Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 7. 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. I like to wait until everybody's found it. Then I can assure the TV audience can do the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, start at verse 7, where Paul now writes to us, Gentiles. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. In other words, in things that had never been revealed before are now made understandable. Even the hidden wisdom, things that Peter said the prophets, what? Diligently looked for and couldn't figure out. Now we got it, see? Now it all comes out. God reveals it. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world or the ages or the generations, time gone by, unto our glory. Now verse 8. 
which none of the princes of this world knew. In other words, these hidden mysteries that Paul is now revealing, especially in his church letters, none of the patriarchs understood, none of the prophets understood, none of the leaders of Israel understood, none of the leaders of the Gentile pagan world had any idea of it, naturally. So none of the princes of this world knew. They did not know who he was. Then what does the rest of the verse say? For had they known it, had they known that he was the creator of the universe, had they known that he was the Son of God, would they have carried out that crucifixion? No way. But they didn't know. All right, now then, for the minute that we have left, come back to Acts chapter 3. They were ignorant of who he was in spite of all of his signs and wonders and miracles. Now verse 18. Got to do this quickly. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, see, like we showed in 1 Peter, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent therefore, be converted, your sins may be blotted out, and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he, God, would send Jesus Christ, see, to be the king. It's still out in their future. But Peter knows in verse 21 that heaven must hold him until the tribulation has run its course. That's the restitution of all things. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to have to bring you all the way down to verse 24 and 25 to put the frosting on what I've been trying to say for the last 14 or 15 years, that Israel was the people of the prophets. Verse 24, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold or prophesied of these days. Verse 25, You, Israel, are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers when he said unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. So Israel alone was under the covenant promises of God. We're outside, Ephesians tells us, we're outside the covenants of promise. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.